Bergson and the Holographic Theory, Part 70, Killing Physics, or Sabine's latest critique of her discipline and a rather wide miss, or the blindness of today's physics. Who's killing physics? So Sabine, I ask recently, her analysis looks for the root cause. Her conclusion, insufficient focus on quantum mechanics measurement problem. To the course of the argument, one such as me gets sadly shocked. She demonstrates virtually unequivocally why physicists currently are hopelessly, bogglingly lost. Apparently oblivious to the extent, depth, and cause of the rot within their subject. Sabine opens with this observation. So for the past century, scientific advances led to technological progress that furthered science, which in return led to more technological progress and so on. It was a virtuous cycle that rapidly raised our standard of living, but in the foundations of physics, this virtual, virtuous cycle broke in the mid 1980s. Since then, we have been in a phase of stagnation. Broke in the 1980s. Well, physics was quick by at least 1927 maybe even 1911. We're in for a bad theory of analysis. Going on, this stagnation has befallen not only cosmology, but also the rest of the foundations of physics, quantum gravity, particle physics, and quantum foundations. You have certainly noticed this yourself. Yep, popular science articles that cover these areas just regurgitate the same topics. Certainly noticed, but a curious list for the quote foundations of physics certainly other things. She notes some salient problems. Dark matter, what is it? Does it even exist? General relativity versus quantum mechanics, no reconciliation. The beginning of the universe, the Big Bang versus some other theory. She says there's plenty of physicists generated ideas, but all have been falsified. The quote, the phrase physicists say is all too frequently followed by speculations about multiverses, non-existent particles, or fifth forces, sad and black holes, information beings followed by black holes, holograms, etc., that we have no evidence of. Sometimes I'm embarrassed to be associated with this discipline. Of course, she says, her colleagues think there is no problem. They tell you about lots of exciting progress that has been published in recent years. At present, the biggest fad is throwing artificial intelligence at everything closely followed by claiming that quantum simulations or quantum computing is the way forward. Lots of papers. Sabine says, this is a delusion of progress, there are lots of papers. And unfortunately, we'll see again why the theoretical basis for quantum mechanics is quantum computing this is yet another myth floating around in their discipline. Some fields have stayed tied to experiment, but she says, but in the foundations of physics, those areas concerned with the most fundamental laws of nature, particle physics, quantum foundations, quantum gravity and cosmology, these are the fundamental laws of nature. There's some things missing here, like electromagnetism. Theory development has decoupled from experimental tests. In the absence of reality checks, pointless speculation became accepted norm. Foundation experiments just confirmed already knowns. The confirmation that neutrinos have masses, that gravitational waves are real, and the detection of the Higgs are recent examples of remarkable experimental achievements in the foundations of physics. But the predictions of these phenomena all date back to before the 1970s, says she. Well, here's another problem. Gravitational waves are real. I hope she's kidding. This involves a convenient collision of two massive black holes, one billion light years from the Earth, which is very nice because one concludes the cal calculations that give a nice result and effect. So fragile, it's barely that of a proton in a mirror being slightly jiggled by a laser beam. In a mirror, because the LIGO installation there is basically an interferometer, just like the Michaels and Morley experiment. You have th those two long arms, 2.5 miles long, uh, with the laser beams going back and forth, bouncing off mirrors coming back, 
to see if there's an interference pattern. And that yellow thing there is a gravity wave that if it hits the uh, arm, horizontal arm, it should shrink it a little bit, therefore causing the two waves to be going back and forth to be unequal in time and an interference pattern. Same thing as the Michelson Morley experiment. So one billion miles away, one billion light years, that is um, hmm, detection possible. Nice, but our sun, detection not possible. Interesting. Did I mention the finding coming just in time for billions of more in funding? So right, this ludicrous finding can be ridiculed into oblivion. You can, I have an article on it from in my site, my web, website. This easy acceptance of BS being just another part of physics problems. And she says, this makes me worry. It's only a matter of time until experimental progress stalls in other areas of physics too. That's because for much of the tale of physics, better observations led to a better understanding of natural laws, which led to better technologies, which led to better observations and so on. This virtuous cycle broke in the middle of the past century. So instead of the 1980s, we're back to the what, 1950s, but no, no, no problem. When foundational research hit the wall, Her focus goes to quantum mechanics, but ever since its conception a century ago, quantum mechanics has given to headaches to philosophers for screwing up our notion of reality. The central ingredient of quantum mechanics, the wave function, which supposedly describes everything we can possibly observe, can't be observed itself. An entire research program of foundations of quantum mechanics, populated mostly by philosophers, sprung up and offered various ways of interpreting quantum math to make more sense of it. Philosophers play an interesting role in her thought here, ultimately. Physicists ignored the philosophers, but now they are beyond debating whether quantum mechanics is inconsistent, but rather why it is so. And she notes a recent paradox, the project of Renner. If you imagine observers observing observers, then in some cases, cases the observers cannot agree on what happened. It is quantum mechanics cannot consistently describe the use of itself. Disconcerting. To her, a big mistake, the focus around the 1980s on smashing particles. It is hoping the new physics would arise from the short distance high energy framework of approach. Again, quoting, in hindsight, physicists should have focused on the problem in front of their eyes, the one they've seen in myriad experiments, the measurement problem of quantum mechanics. So on that measurement problem, she says, the problem is that a theory that describes nature on the fundamental level shouldn't rely on vague terms like measurement. It should instead explain what a measurement is. Now, the quantum mechanics can't do this as the reason for paradoxes, like that of the project of Renner, which we just noted, and also why quantum mechanics is decried as strange, weird, and impossible to understand. And she basically ends with this. At last, it seems the shut up and calculate doctrine, which is basically this, the Niels Bohr, Copenhagen interpretation, which basically comes down to science is no looking inside the box, whether it be the black box of Schrodinger, or as we see, it's very reminiscent of the Skinnerian behaviorism, no looking inside the box of the brain, strange resonance. But to continue that quote, the shut up and calculate doctrine, which has dominated quantum mechanics for a half a century, is losing its grip on the community. And this is why I am more optimistic today than we'll, that we will finally make progress in the foundations of physics than I was 10 years ago. I'm not optimistic. And what Sabina is missing? Let us count the ways. Start with special relativity. There's no awareness that this is a fundamental problem. The current ubiquitous interpretation, special relativity accounts for time changes, quote unquote. The increased lifespans of muons with velocity, slowed clocks on Friday than jets, or differently aging twins, where one twin is as aging process retarded, the other way more physically aged, definite physical difference. 
but this is a completely invalid use of special relativity. It destroys the logical structure of the theory. In other words, to explain these, a new theory is needed. I would suspect J J uh, J Sabina would say, a new theory? Say what? And in this, she would echo Andre Metz, the physicist Bergson had a discussion with in Review Philosophique in 1924. Because Metz, a physicist, simply could not get through his head that special relativity cannot explain this, just could not penetrate. Bergson gave up. But think of the nature of this new theory. These, quote, time, unquote, changes, because it's not changes of time, are physical effects of velocity. Think about this, the physical effects of velocity. What does this mean? This means that both the matter field and the motion of, quote, objects, unquote, within this field is not truly understood. One can even wonder, we'll take a little speculative drip for a second, if this extends to Dr. Leithwaite and his gyros. Dr. Eric Leithwaite, considered the father of maglev, by the way, he was no slouch, he gave this famous lecture at Jabberwock in 1974. And he demonstrated lots of stuff about gyroscopes. For example, here's an extremely heavy gyro. I have 60 pounds, it might be more, 75 pounds. It's on a hinge. There's the hinge and it's being spun up. You can't quite see it there, but there's like a drill-like thing just spinning this thing up at a, at a rapid stage. Once it's spun up, it's now floating around in the horizontal plane on the hinge. I mean. That's 75 pounds there or, or thereabouts. It should just be falling down on the floor. But as it spins and precesses around the post, it simply floats around, so to speak. Why? Well, physicists assisted Newton's laws could explain these phenomena. There's another little one right there. See the gyro happily precessing. It's going around there. Another aspect of its motion. Long after the platform, that metal platform, the silver platform, it's, it is extended past its tipping point. Here, when we take, when we stop the gyro, that thing just tips, and some of those weights there are the amount. You, you just you have to put a whole lot of weights there to balance that uh, gyro uh, uh, against that uh, the end of that the platform for it not to tip. But when it's precessing around, it doesn't tip. Now, Lathway said he could find no one who would explain how this is so, how these laws explain the gyro in detail, actually, with a proof. However, he was ostracized. Toward the end of his life, he worked steadily to fully understand gyros then. He did measurements on scales, which seemed to show no weight loss, sort of torpedoing the idea that somehow there's anti-gravity involved, somehow. He concluded Newton's laws could explain things, as wikis surely are sure to note. But the video discussion of this phase, it's linked in wiki, see, there's a video one, leaves one rather disconcerted because you see anonymous fluctuations in weight in his data, which are simply ignored. And one gets the distinct feeling that Dr. Lathith was just overwhelmed with the desire to be allowed back into the fold to get rid of his ostracization. But just to further disabuse us at the notion that all is so serene in fundamental physics, that we remind of this. There is no theory of lift. They have no idea how airplanes stay afloat. You see my site for an article on this. The, the entire theory of the airfoil, the wing form, has been destroyed. That destruction is staring you right in the face in the plane flying upside down, obviously inverting its airfoil and flying perfectly well. There's Scientific American admitting it, finally. Kind of forced to admit it due to a Miles Mathis article. Well, let's add one more. There's Newton's bucket. Newton simply, well, simply I visualize twisting a bucket. To, a little inset there shows the, the bucket wound up in a rope and then let it go. And the water plasters against the side of the bucket. 
So his bucket was a demonstration that there is an absolute reference frame. He asked, how can the motions or slash force of the water be relativized with respect to the bucket? And I quote Ehrman in the book there, World Enough in Space Time, to quote, there has yet to be a relational, let alone a relativistic explanation of Newton's bucket. So just to disabuse us that there's that everything is so serene and understood, and not just simply having been rolled and steamrolled over in, in uh, basic physics. And this brings us to this, the ether and special relativity. The logically consistent version of special relativity was deployed to explain Michelson Morley, that inferometer. Note, to explain the motion of an object, namely the Earth, through the material field, then termed the ether. Back to the physical effects of velocity. In the consistent version of special relativity, in explaining the Michelson Morley experiment, the effects are purely measurement effects. As we've noted, the expectation for the uh, interference interferometer was there would be an interference pattern. Normally, you have the light rays being sent from that light wave emitter through each arm, tube, so to speak, bouncing off the mirror and coming back. And they would, the waves would be perfectly coincident, equal times, equal distances, no interference pattern. But throw in that ether current, if the Earth is moving through the ether, then with a little Pythagorean math, one discovers that the uh, wave traveling through that horizontal arm would take longer. Therefore, there should be an interference pattern. The waves should match. But the finding was there was no interference pattern. So Lorentz argued with arguments, electrodynamical arguments, that the arm physically shortens due to its motion to the ether. Just enough to explain it. The um, arm compensates, the shortened arm compensates for the uh, longer time. Einstein, in the special relativity framework, was effectively arguing it's all a measurement effect. There is no actual shortening in contradiction to Lorentz, who had a physical model of the shortening. What's a measurement effect? Well, I've noted before, I measure my toaster. Two different rulers. Ruler one is, says it's nine inches long. Ruler two, six inches long. The toaster is not physically contracting, obviously. It's a measurement effect due to two different rulers. In special relativity, the rulers are clocks and light rays. All special relativity's effects, so-called, are measurement effects, not real ontological effects, but to preserve the explanation then, the effects cannot be taken as ontological, and as real or physical. The explanation of Michael said morally, those arms cannot be physically contracting. The Lorentz transformations, however, form a closed group. Space changes compensate for time changes. The space units contract in exact proportion as time units expand. So they must be of the same order, that is measurement. You can't pull them apart and treat them differently. But time changes now, slowed clocks, slower aging twin, are very real, very ontological. They can't be measurement effects. And yet, these are now what special relativity is taking to explain. But this is not a valid use of special relativity. SR cannot be used to explain ontological effects. Again, physics needs a new, a different theory. Simply put, Matter and moral explanation is not complete disarray. Bergson had this argument with a physicist in 1924 in the Review of Philosophique, Andre Metz. He just, he, Metz, just could not get through his skull that physics needs a new theory to explain this. Couldn't get it. Bergson gave up. But now also then in disarray, the supposed disappearance of the ether. The history of experiments on detection of the ether along Michelson-Morley lines is very long. Michelson-Morley is just part of a series. It's a long and involved history. I don't have the book now. I, had, I found it in the University of Minnesota Library long ago in, in the 70s. 
you'd be you'd be amazed at the uh, at the uh, attempts to uh, look at this re replicated, etc., high up on the mountains, whatever. So the ether's disappearance is far from clear cut. This is not to mention other types of contradictory experiments. For example, the Sagnat experiment of 1913, pictured up there, much more complicated interferometer apparatus. Basically, you've got um, this apparatus rotating, I'm waiting for that picture to rotate. There you see, you begin to get the idea. It's going to be much more complicated. In other words, it's far more complex and cannot be explained by the logic of special relativity. Or there was Aries failure all the way back in 1971. Aries failure, the failure being because there's a failure in showing motion through the ether. You have a water-filled telescope there, and in a moving Earth, the light from the star, given that angle of the telescope, should not hit the bottom of the telescope, not hit the base of the telescope, but it does. Just this fundamental experimental problem sitting there at the base of physics. Unintegrated, probably in wiki explained away. So this entire subject is basically just ignored. But it is indeed foundational. The physics misuse of special relativity as an explanation was the heart of the debate between Bergson and and Einstein is misuse of special relativity. The debate started with Einstein's acceptance of Langevin's twin paradox, where the time changes are real, ontological. The twins truly physically differentially age. It's not a measurement effect. It's an ontological effect. But SR is supposed to explain this. He Einstein said, oh yes, SR explains this, but it cannot. It can only do measurement effects. Yes, Bergson was defending the flow of time as invariant for all observers, and also the absolute reality of the simultaneity in this flow and the tra dynamic transformation, transformational change of the universal field. So the debate was far, far, far from being just about the philosopher's quote, live time, unquote, versus the objective time of the physicist, as one would gather from this book, completely missing the core of the issue. The invalid misuse of special relativity was the core of the problem. But the lore was Einstein won the debate and physics triumphantly moved on. Right. No, Einstein and Bergson in the debate that changed our understanding of time. How changed? Well, implications towards Einstein's view of time, the block universe. But if you read this book by Bergson, subsequent to the debate, it's impossible to read and not realize that Einstein was wrong, that he lost. Einstein admitted, it's quoted in the, uh, the Physics and Philosopher book, that Bergson perfectly understood special relativity. So Bergson might have been a philosopher, but to all intents and purposes, he was acting in this debate as a physicist. To say the logical structure of your theory does not allow it to explain lifespan increases in muons is not a philosophical point. It's the point of one physicist to another. Physicists seem to have been very good at failing to grasp when philosophers are acti actually acting as physicists, and validly so. So social dynamic forces, I'll call them, Tons of other things I don't think we even want to go into played an enormous role here. Of course, you have this all sort of washed over by this particular book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Kuhn viewed the transition from Newton to Einstein as a paradigm for a rather, well, pristine, compared to what I'm describing, intellectual revolution in science, all based in kind of overwhelming evidence and logic but a, a bit involved with the, an old guard passing away, some of which were never quite convinced, and for good reason. But this account generally is massively narrow, myopic, naive, and vastly misleading. There was nothing good about this revolution from Einstein. So the misuse also struck at the nature of time. 
Special relativity is a logic, logical endpoint of the classic metaphysic, where time is abstractly reduced to a form of space, a series of instant, instantaneous blocks of space. Move the cup along that abstract space, which is basically a principle of infinite divisibility, and then becoming an infinitely divisible continuum of points positions. Each point along the way is an instant. An instantaneous block, instantaneous block of the all of space. So add that in with a bit of the relativistic idea of relativity and get the 4D space-time block, where there is actually no plane of becoming. It's just one block, as we know. But this is not the concrete time of the universe, the concrete flow, duration. It is indivisible flow, each instant quote unquote, permitting the next, like the notes of a melody, always building, or an organic continuity. But in physics, this artificial abstract time, which relativity is the epitome of, has now become totally ingrained, as real, as factual. This framework is the basis of mathematics. It sits at the basis of the, the, basis of the wave equation. And, it is, and in, innumerable theorems all holding up physics. Again, it's foundational, but it's something that needs to be examined because this is not real time. It's an abstract time. And then things are going to begin falling through the cracks because it becomes an approximation to the real. Notice at the heart of the wave equation there that, that uh, e, to, e to the i pi, that is the uh, Euler identity, which allows, in essence, an eternal reset to zero, as though we're unchanged and once we make go through the cycle. There's no change, there's no building, there's no, no building, no permeation of one note into the next, etc. It's an abstract time at the heart of physics. And so as Abina notes that quantum mechanics cannot be reconciled to general relativity, one must ask to what version of special relativity is quantum mechanics going to be reconciled? To the logically consistent or to the inconsistent? This is not even a question to physics. It's amazing. And yet, speaking of general relativity, Bergson showed that this inconsistency resides in Einstein's thought experiments at the foundation of general relativity. It is the foundation of general relativity is invalid. Yes, again, foundational. Those thought experiments, the elevator, the rotating disk, in the rotating disk, in that thought experiment, you, the, the physicist walks out along that radius with the clock and it slows down due to, due to acceleration as the disk rotates. But, as Bergson noted, the observer takes with him his own reference system. As far as that walking guy is going, concerned, he's at rest. Forget the fact that he's walking, just have him moving abstractly along, because everything's abstract in, in special relativity. It's all totally abstract. So he's just moving along, moving, quote unquote, moving along. But he's at rest, only from the, a uh, omniscient observer's point of view is he moving. In other words, Einstein forgot the reciprocity of observers. This cannot be, again, a real effect but he's taking it as a real effect, just like the time changes. The elevator problem is yet, yet another problem one can go into. Uh, that's, the run, that's discussed in my 8A8B. And this brings us to the other player in the fall of the ether. Quantum mechanics and the photoelectric effect. This is the lore. Einstein dealt the ether its death blow via double whammy. In his two papers in 1905, Special Relativity and the Photoelectric Effect. The ether, the medium of energy transmission at that time, of waves, the medium, the transmission of waves, waves being a disturbance propagating through the medium, that is through the ether. But now via the photoelectric effect, energy just travels in bullets, so as packets, ultimately, well, ultimately dubbed photons. Strange little bullets that somehow have a frequency. No medium needed. To quote, note, noting that little picture there, the 
photoelectric effect. You have a metal plate illuminated with a sufficiently high frequency, and electrons emerge with an energy proportional to this frequency. And as Schrodinger noted in 1952, this was, and I'm afraid still is regarded as, I'm afraid still is regarded as, convincing evidence of the instantaneous transfer of whole quanta of energy from the light to the electron. And that instantaneity of transfer is a fundamental problem. It's a myth. So waves gone, ether gone. And photons now here, quanta now here, the start of quantum mechanics. Just that easy, except, except waves not gone. There's a paper I noted by Lemon Scully in 1968, the photoelectric effect without photons. To quote, in conclusion, we understand the photo effect as being the result of a classical field falling on a quantized atomic electron. The introduction of the photon concept is neither logically implied by nor necessary for the explanation of the photoelectric effect. Worse yet, Schrodinger in 1952. But according to wave mechanics, as put forward by de Broglie and myself, the interpretation does produce without delay electronic wave trains of the higher frequency or higher velocity that we observe emerging from the metal. Note, there are the bottom right there. What we're referring to in the standard explanation of the photoelectric effect, a little wave particle with an energy, the little pink thing there, hits a electron seen in an orbit visualizes an energy well, so to speak, and bops it out of that energy well, like in a sudden instantaneous leap. Instantaneous, no transition, no development, nothing. So it knocks the electrons off the metal plate out of that energy well with a certain velocity proportional to the uh, frequency of the impacting wave on that plate. That's what, it's, that's what he's referring to there. So he says, no, he says, wave mechanics can explain this without Einstein. After this has been recognized, he says, is the probability scheme any longer needed as the idea of mysterious sudden leaps of single electrons not become gratuitous? Notice, what's he mean? The probability scheme. Well, it's this, trying to save particles, born, turn the waves of wave mechanics back into particles. 1926, the same year wave mechanics was born. Waves superpose, naturally. Particles do not. They cannot occupy the same spatial position. So born turned this into the probability of locating the particle via the Born rule, taking the square of psi. But, says Schrodinger, the waves are there anyhow, and we are not at a loss to prove it. We need only put a tube of crystal powder in the way of the emerging beam, electrons popping out there, and produce an interference pattern of the type first achieved by G.P. Thompson. So wait, so what happened to that double whammy? Special relativity plus the photoelectric effect. Apparently the photoelectric effect wasn't much of a whammy. So that the ether was destroyed, that waves were destroyed is a myth, a myth at the base of current physics. But speaking of Schrodinger brings us to the measurement problem. The measurement problem assumes Born in his Copenhagen framework. Again, as just noted, wave mechanics was co-opted, I'll say, and born by 1926, the same year of wave mechanics emerged. Trying to save particles, born turned waves back into waves back into particles. Superposition in waves is natural. How do you superpose particles? How do they occupy the same space? Well, the answer is you don't. So again, as noted, born, born 
Born turned this into the probability of locating the particle via the Born rule. Schrader, a year later, I am averse to this conception. He despised it. The Schrader notes, Planck had discovered a discontinuity with respect to the exchange of energy between a material system and the radiation of light slash heat. And this is in the black body effect. Planck was hesitant about this discreteness, says Schrodinger, for good reasons. Again, this discreteness. Remember, you're getting this all or none sudden change, switch from this to that. I have to note, when I, when I go through 45C on the, on the black body, Planck's solution to the black body, in my opinion, carries a very ad hoc flavor. I don't think you can escape it. But, Schrodinger notes, Einstein and the photoelectric effect blew this hesitancy away. Again, the lower being, well, we're, yep, it's photons carrying energy, knocking things instantaneously out of little energy holes or wells. And later Bohr, explaining the light spectra, took discrete states as a genuine fact. But, notes, notes Schrodinger, Bohr's great deficiency Silence about the period of transitions. Intermediary states were disallowed. Thus, these transitions became jumps, the famous quantum jumps. As Schrodinger notes, wave superposition does away with the prerogative of stationary states, therefore jumping from one state to another. That is, a loss on one side and an instantaneous gain on the other via a little energy packet. A wave mechanical system is not affected in only one proper mode of vibration, shall we say, at a time. But the usage of energy levels, quote, transitions, quote, unquote, transition probabilities implies this. Planck's energy parcels reinforces this, he said. It's a product of H by a frequency, that is E equals H nu, implies a bundle of energy, E, lost by one system, the sad face, and gained by another, the happy face, instantaneously with no transition, no period of, or transitional phases between. So Schrodinger says, well, QM's correction to the state of affairs already sitting there in the supposed photoelectric effect, um, explanation thereof, this correction was via a new description of the states. This is more especially via more wave mechanics. States were not abandoned, but shifted, he said, to the vision of proper modes, like a bell struck, a drum head struck, the superposition of compar comparatively simple proper vibrations. There's a vibration of a single normal mode of a circular disk. So Schrodinger drew out the ramifications of this vision to include the inadequacy of psi. Let that one sink in, because psi cannot handle complex interactions. It's linear. So, one, the measurement problem, quote unquote, only exists due to Born. To include the measurement problem inheritance of the still mysterious, quote unquote, transitions. And let that sink in. Two, psi itself is inadequate by Schrodinger's own discussion. Where does Schrodinger's critique go? Why is it ignored? Isn't this at the heart of the measurement problem? Just saying. Physics problems start way before the measurement problem. Greatly truncated here, my discussion in number 60 of Schrodinger's 1952 paper. In his wave mechanical framework, the interaction of two systems, the transitions, like the photon striking the electron on the metal plate, becomes a distuning of the proper modes of two wave mechanical systems and subsequent retuning. But as he notes, they cannot be said to approach each other to think of atoms and molecules in pure energy states, moving hither and thither, colliding and rebounding contradicts the fundamental concepts of the theory. Where anything happens, we are not facing pure energy states. In other words, 
the interactions with proper modes is way more complex than is portrayed in the uh, standard physics texts or expositions of the photoelectric effect, etc. Within this, there's this wave mechanical understanding. Each system occupies the whole of space. To quote, translatory motion with precisely fixed velocity is wave mechanically represented by a plane sinusoidal wave filling the whole of space. Now play this statement against special relativities, relativity of, relativity of simultaneity, the statement coming up. There are many experiments which we simply could not account for without taking the wave to be a wave, acting simultaneously throughout the region over which it spreads, that is, simultaneously all along its front, not perhaps here or perhaps there, as the probability view would have it. So yes, the supposed relativity of simultaneity, again, by inference, and not the logical effect of an aspect of the universal field, its transformation collapses. It does not exist. It is completely contradictory to wave mechanics, which says special relativity has collapsed. It's the same problem. The matter field is and contains real, not relative, organic motion, motion that cannot be relativized, as we've seen discussed via Bergson. That rose growing organically in the organic transformation, which is the whole universal field. Say that growth strikes two points simultaneously. That cannot be declared non-simultaneous by claiming all of relativity that the observer is in motion. His clocks are screwed up, not, not, not in sync, not without destroying the organic growth motion, which is absurd. So this was argued by Bergson in Duration and Simultaneity already in 1922, but even before that, Matter Memory in 1896. In other words, it was part of that debate with Einstein. Physics has to rewind its clock to before 1905. So the ether was joined to the hip with electromagnetism in the old days, in the physics of Maxwell, Heaviside, Tesla, Steinmetz, Alexanderson. Tremendous strides were being made. All progress stopped trick in 1920, roughly the time, well, coinciding with quantum mechanics, special relativity and general relativity, and again, a few other non-physics things. Like in 1920, Roosevelt making the ownership of radios illegal for a while in the establishment of RCA as a monopoly over uh, electrical parts and therefore experimentation. It is far more true to say this revolution, this revolution, electromagnetism, not quantum mechanics, is what truly underlies our modern technology. This image there of, tes of Tesla and all that stuff going on just a testimony to what we don't understand. And we throw in a few non-physics things like this trunks of papers has mysteriously vanished somewhere deep within the government. It's far more complicated than, when, than trying to stay as I am within just a pure physics intellectual frame. But in my opinion, we are far from truly understanding the ether, magnetism or electromagnetism. The goal, this goal, that understanding is certainly neither in the mindset nor agenda of Sabina. So what is killing physics? Well, an interesting quote from Schrodinger. There were other ingenious constructs of the human mind that gave an exceedingly accurate description of observed facts and yet have lost all interest except the historians. For example, the epicycles of planetary motion. The modern analog of epicycles Schrodinger prophesied are the quantum jumps. Actually from Schrodinger's 1952 paper. So a few things that are killing physics, in my humble opinion. In education, a very selective narrative with respect to its history, especially with respect to Michelson Morley and the ether. 
and all the stuff that went on there. In a word, a form of indoctrination into a framework. Physicists can't seem to discern when the philosophers are essentially acting in the role of physicists, as Bergson was. Though they themselves, I might note, equally without official degrees therein, don't hesitate to pour into consciousness, thus into perception, memory, cognition, etc. Missing a critical examination of the role of mathematics, its successes, but successes, but critically its limitations in explaining the concrete physical world, that is, the matter field dynamically transforming in concrete time or more simply a stubborn refusal to examine its underlying metaphysical space and time. Just a few of the things. So next time we'll see. Till then, signing off.